Good evening, everyone out there on the internet land. Uh, it's Code Primate Labs. Heath Haskins here. This is going to be a special edition for botting. We're going to talk about concepts and ideas and theories about what makes a good bot, what makes a bad bot, how to do a bot, when to use a bot, what a bot actually is, and all the good stuff. So this is going to be called Botting 101. Uh, yeah, definitely a 101. You could even call this a 050 class. So I've been getting a lot of questions about like, uh, hey, can you make a bot to do this? Can you make a bot to do that? And the first thing is, what is a bot? Is a bot? Question mark. So you might have heard a lot of things like uh, aimbot and term of uh, farmbot. So what's the difference in between these two types of bots? First off, an aimbot isn't really a bot. Okay, and a farm bot is a bot. What's the biggest difference? An aim bot is an assist. All right, it assists you with a task such as aiming or shooting somebody. Uh, a farm bot, a farm bot, you can go AFK, away from keyboard. Okay, when you've got a farm bot, that means you can step away from the keyboard and the bot will continue to play afterwards. That's the biggest difference in between what a bot is and what uh, either a hack or a program or um, a cheat is. All right. So what, what do you look for when you're trying to figure out to bot something, uh, when you're looking for a task to bot something? Can you do it? Can you do it yourself. Meaning, is the task able to be repeated? Uh, can you do it with the mouse clicks? Can you do it with the keyboard? This is one of the key concepts. If you can't do it, most likely you're not talking about an actual like bot to do it for you. Now, this there are a couple exceptions to this. One is memory bots and bots. And we'll talk about what these are in just a little bit. The, the second exception to the rule is um, something like a Skype bot. Uh, Skype bot. Oh, 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 Skype bot. All right. A memory bot, it actually looks inside the RAM and modifies or reads what's going on with the, the program that you're trying to play. So like in a video game where you've got X amount of gold and you're looking to increase that gold, you look for a specific um, line or a specific address uh, for a variable. If that variable is not there, most likely it's either a pointer or a float of some kind, and you have to go and find that float or point. Uh, with a Skype bot, um, this is something that gives a response to something, not necessarily through um, a mouse click and a typing of a keyboard, but it looks for a call on a port. Um, okay, okay, I probably lost you guys on that. So, yeah, let's let's yeah, let's go back. Um, let's talk about when to use a bot. When to use use a bot. All right, the best scenario that I can think of is when there is a task that you're doing over and over and over again, a mundane task, mundane task. Uh, what does this include? This could include leveling, farming, and crafting. So leveling, farming, crafting. Um, when else should you use a bot? Um, when task requires requires quick Response. Uh, response. What is what is what is? Hold on. Response. Wow, I would not be good as a teacher. 
That's <laughs> horrible. Uh, when the task requires a quick response, um, such as clicking a whole bunch of different um, places on the screen at one time, uh, you would use a bot to do this instead of um, like an app or something like that. So, all right. On what level can you use a bot? Now, there's this is a big controversy, and there's a big, um, big to do about which bots are best, which bots get detected. First off, the bots that I use, all right, they work on, oh, what is it? The OSI stack, OSI stack, layer, layer seven. What does that mean? That is the application layer. All right, so in the OSI stack, you've got layer one, all right, one, two, three, four, five, six, doesn't go off screen, seven. The first layer is physical. Uh, actually, let's go backwards from this because I always do this backwards. So we do application, presentation, uh, application, presentation, Data link. No. Application presentation session. N Network. Transport. and data link. And last one is physical. So application presentation session, network transport, data link. Uh, I actually have the stack upside down, that's okay. Um, all of my bots that I've shown you so far, they're dealing with this right here, the application level. Um, right, 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 oh, hold on. Zip, boop, there we go. So on the application level, you're dealing with mouse clicks, you're dealing with um, keyboard commands. This is the application layer. Presentation, this is what medium it's coming across. So um, for example, it, if you're using API calls and you're making calls to um, the actual program itself, but not necessarily to the GUI, that's the presentation layer right here. Session. This is the layer in which the user is sitting on. So when you log into a machine, that is your session layer. Just think of it as login. Uh, login to Windows, not login to your application. This, yeah. So network. This deals with like TCP slash IP. This is your network protocol. This uh, layer is the one that you would use to do like man in the middle attack. Man in the middle, holy crap, there we go. Uh, and then you've got uh, transport, which would be SSL or SSH or whatever your transport layer is. Um, these are your socket layers, these are your um, yeah, different layers in there. And then your data link, these are your routers and switches. Routers and switches. And this is why I type everything out. And physical, this is the actual network cable. The physical cable that plugs into your router, plugs into your computer, that fits on the physical layer. Whenever you're troubleshooting something, for the, all of those IT ninjas out there and all those help desk gurus that are looking to troubleshoot the first thing that's happening whenever something goes wrong, turn it off and back on again, and then look at the physical layer, the first layer. If somebody can't get out to the internet, see if they unplug their computer from the wall. Just saying. That's uh, that's the majority of like where my phone calls come from. So. 
um, the bots that I show you always work on the application layer. The only time that I've changed this was whenever I'm doing um, Internet Explorer and you see me create object, and then I'm working with the actual DOM itself, which is inside the presentation layer. Rarely do I actually get into the session. Um, I don't mess with session protocols, stuff like that. You can. Um, something that would work along this lines would be changing what the um, program is talking to. Um, for example, instead of running Windows, you get it to run on Wine, and then Wine would be your session layer. Um, network, this one's a really good one, because if you can intercept a network traffic, then you're basically in. Because, uh, and by the way, this is also one of the hardest, so we'll put level, level 22. Level, tw level 22 admins and hackers right there, blah, 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 blah. So, the reason network is really hard is because of secure socket layers and because of, what's the other one? What's the other one? Um, oh, I can't think of it. TSL, transport socket layer, which is actually here, but we won't talk about that. The reason this is important to know is because, say you've got your computer over here, Ooh, doo -doo 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 -doo, right? And you're playing a game out there on the internet. And they've got a server hooked up that's hosting this thing. Now, most likely, this is a virtual machine nowadays. And boop, 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 boop. A little uh, rack here in the front. There we go. So here's your game. This is you talking back and forth to the, uh, the server, to the game. If you can intercept this layer, zoop, Zoop. Smiley face. You can essentially read off all the data that's getting sent to you and all the data coming from the application. The reason this is important is because you can inject or you can modify what's getting sent to and from that server. So the server might send, hey, there's a boss in front of you that's worth 300 experience points. You take and intercept that 300 XP and you now make it worth 3000 XP if you have that SSL layer or if you've cracked that layer or if they're not using SSL, which would be awesome. It's not done very often. But now you can get 3000 experience for killing the boss that was only worth 300 before. The other things that you could do is change his HP. Uh, see he had 200 HP and now it's worth 1. HP. Awesome, right? Now, this is one of the hardest things to do, and a lot of people are asking me, hey, why don't you make a bot that does this? Well, it's because this layer is sitting on SSL. In order to do this, you have to create a program that basically listens and relays. So, um, big screen right there. Here's my little computer desktop, right? And then here's my little game over here. Game. That's a horrible G. So there's my, oh, uh, you can't see. Let's do that again. There we go. So here's my desktop screen. Right, with my little start menu down here at the bottom, awesome stuff right here. Might have a couple applications open. All right, you've got your game running up here at the top. Whatever game it is. Game. And what it's doing, it's, it's talking to the operating system. That operating system then is sending the traffic out to wherever it needs to go. Um, one of the biggest tools that you can use to get this is called Wireshark. Wireshark is one of your best tools for intercepting whoop, intercepting TCP slash IP protocols. You can also grab everything from any port. Basically, it's a monitoring tool. Monitoring tool. Um, what this does, it allows you to read the traffic that's going in between you and a program. Um, the agar bots that you see doing this, 
they had to use some kind of sniffing tool so they could get the client. Um, okay, hold on. I lost myself. Why was I over here doing this? I was drawing this. Um, okay, so instead of you making, like starting up the game, you would create your bad program. Sorry, bot program. Bot. Um, let's say this is running on port 2973, right? So that game is running on port 2973. And you can get that from looking inside the IP con or not IP config. Uh, what is it? Blah, 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 blah. Netstat. You can find out what ports this program is using, and then you can create your own bot to use port two nine seven three. Just saying that this is this is an example. So what you would do is you would start up your bot whenever you're creating it to listen on that port for a specific command. So. Uh, if you are listening to the game, the game might send a login command or an acknowledgement command or a hello command, H-E-L-O command. And the server out here, let's clear this off, out here in the cloud, way back here in the distance, and we'll make it look like it's going off like that. The server that's way over here, hello server, that's a horrible drawing, it says hello. Hello. And no, I didn't misspell it. That's how they actually acknowledge stuff, which is brings me to my next one, ACT, which acknowledges. So your computer sends off a signal to the server. It says, or you say hello. It says acknowledged, and then this handshake starts to happen, and that's how it secures its its layers. It'll say, hey, I need a certificate. Hey, I've got a certificate. Hey, is it a valid certificate? Yes, it's a valid certificate. Okay, we're going to use this, and now we're going to start talking, and that's when it starts encrypting. Encrypting. Encrypted. Yeah. We'll just make a little lock. Boop, 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 boop. Encrypted. Boop, and a little keyhole like that. Perfect. So now it's got a secure connection in between the two. These are really hard to hack. These are really hard to get into. Like, you're going to have to go above and beyond what I'm going to teach you about bots. So that should explain what a, oh, what was that? Layer 4 bot does. Um, okay, now that that's said and done, let's go to um, TCP slash IP. TCP slash IP. So forget the TCP part. We're worried about this, the IP. Um, yeah, transport communication layer or telecommunications protocol, just so you know. Yeah. All right, IP, Internet protocol internet protocol protocol now you can see how illiterate I am. illiterate I am and I can't spell so internet protocol every computer every device that gets connected to a network is going to go through this thing called DHCP unless it's been static IP'd static IP'd most likely it's not but when you first plug a computer or plug a I want to say a phone, but phones have to be configured differently. Any kind of device into the network or you get on somebody's Wi-Fi, DHCP is either a router or it's a server out there that's going to pass out the IP address. And the way it does this is through your MAC. So your MAC address, um, MAC address, say it's 0DCAFF... Um, E N E E. One, two, three, four, five. Six. Oh, let's do this. I ran off the screen. Oh no! Can I push it? Can I push it over? Just a little bit. Ah, oh, there, okay. So your MAC address, and this one just happened to says zero decaf coffee, which is also the actual MAC address. Anyhow, don't use that. Um, 
the MAC address, the first two is going to determine the manufacturer, so like Cisco, Asus, um, Viso, Linux, or not Linux, Linksys, which was bought by Cisco, IBM, which was bought by Lenovo. Or by certain. I'm not too sure on that. Maybe it was the Think brand. Think brand. Anyhow, first two oxets are going to tell you, or first two hexadecimals are going to tell you the manufacturer of that device, uh, and they've actually extended it to the third one, I believe. Anyhow, it's going to turn into this thing called an ARP, Address Relay Protocol. So what that does, it says this MAC address belongs to this IP. And that IP address could be 192.168.0.37 or something like that. Um, you're going to have your first layer, which is um, 192.168.0.37. Oh, and X cannot be a 1, it cannot be 255, and it can't be something else. I think it's 250 or something like that. Anyhow, the reason why is because 1 is always the gateway, 255 is the broadcast, and 250 was something else, but I can't remember what it is. And most likely, that's only going to have a range of 50 if you're on a home network. Most ranges are like um, 50 through 100 or something like that. The reason this is important is because each computer on your network has a specific IP address, and what you can do on your side is use something called Kane and Abel, for all you hacker gurus out there. Or if you don't like that, you can use something like um, Zen, what's it called? Net, nope, not net. Um, InMap, InMap. Uh, I don't think you can do poisoning with InMap. So that's a question mark. Question mark on that one. Basically, what ARP is, um, it's your address relay really pro protocol saying that this MAC address belongs to this IP address and vice versa. So what can you do with the ARP table? With ARP, you can perform what's called ARP poisoning. Poisoning. And basically what this is, is your computer. Uh, you Let's say you've got computer number one over here. And I'm just drawing laptops. I'm not drawing desktops. PC one and um, server. Server one. Right, and they're talking back and forth, no problem. You got communication going back and forth, right? Now, both of these have an ARP table. ARP. 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 And what you're going to do is you're going to fire up your program. You're going to put your computer into what's called monitoring mode monitoring mode and then you're going to broadcast out that oh that's horrible I wish I had more room and a bigger screen you're gonna put your computer let's see Bad guy computer. Grr. And it's going to poison the ARP table. It's going to say this x dot x dot x dot 13 and say this is x dot x dot x dot 40. All right. Your computer is going to start talking on this network just for a moment and it's going to say, I am 
x dot x dot x dot 13. And I am x dot x dot x dot 40. So what this does, and this actually works better with Wi-Fi signals. So yeah, let's get rid of the line here. Get rid of the line. Bring this back up. There we go. We're just going to say Wi-Fi signals. There we go. Wi-Fi signals going back and forth. So you start broadcasting out, hey, I am that same one. I am this address and I'm this address. So now you can use your Wireshark to the rescue. And you're just going to sit there and listen. And any traffic that gets sent out from the PC, you're going to pick up because it thinks you're the server. And any traffic that gets sent out from the server, you're going to pick up because it thinks you're the client. This is what's called ARP poisoning. This is also known as a man-in-the-middle attack. And this is on a network level. Okay, so what you're doing is you're poisoning on a physical outside your computer layer. This is important, and I'll show you why. So, the reason I explained what an ARP table is and why you can do ARP poisoning is because you can kind of do the exact same thing inside your computer. Inside your computer, there's a file called the host file. And it's either host or host? Question mark? Host? Host. Something like this. Anyhow, you can find this inside the C Windows slash system. Sys wow. System 32 slash drivers slash Etsy slash host. Now, by default, you can't modify this directly. You have to run Notepad as administrator, or you have to pull that file out to your desktop, modify it, then put it back. And that's because the UAC. And I don't like UAC. User access control. And if you look on all the forms, they tell you to turn that off. Don't ever actually turn it off because they need to learn how to program around it. <clears throat> okay, off my soapbox. So why do you need to jump over here to do um, your host file? Well, for a simple reason, that whenever your computer makes a request out to the Internet, it has to go through a DNS, a dynamic name server. And the reason it does this is because Google, Google.com, the computer doesn't know what that means, question mark. So what it does, it comes out here to DNS and says, hey, what is Google? What is that? DNS, dynamic name server, looks through its huge list of tables and says, ah, there's Google. And it goes to one, two, three, blah, blah, blah. And actually, here, I'll do a known one. 8.8.8.8. By the way, that's Google's DNS, if you ever need one. Ah, ha, ha. Thumbs up on that little bit. Yeah. Yay, thumbs up. I'm a horrible artist. <laughs> Anyhow, that's what DNS is. Well, before your computer makes that call, it's going to take a look at this host file and see if there's any kind of entries for it. And inside the host file, you're going to see stuff like 12, wait, um, yeah, 125.0.0.1 and local host. Basically, if you make a call to 125.0.0, that points to local host or vice versa. If you point, to, uh, if you put in HTTP colon slash slash local, local host, that essentially is called a loop back. And that is going to talk to your computer directly. The reason this is important is because you're going to poison the host file. So when you make a, a request out to HTTP colon slash slash um, 
runescape, sorry runescape, dot com, instead of it going out the thing, you're going to put in here in your host file, um, 125.0.0.1, and point it to runescape.com. Now you got to remember that you did this, otherwise later on down the road you'll be like, oh, I can't get out to the website, I don't know what's happening. That's because you can forget the things that you've done in the past, so make sure that you remember how to get back in there and how to fix it. Any time that your program now makes a request out to runescape.com, it's going to say, hey, that points to 125.0.0.1. And what you're going to have is you're going to have another program prog sitting on your your computer that's going to be listening to that same port that runescape was using so instead of it going out to the internet out to this lovely cloud your computer is going to pick it up and you can now listen to what programs like what calls it was trying to make out to the internet the reason this is important is because you can get um, the process of what a program is doing to log in. Um, the way you do this, whoa, 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 Mr. Anderson. Matrix reference. Uh, you start up the program, oh, hold on. Mm. We're not going to call it a bot yet because it's not quite a bot. Listener. You're going to create a listener on your side and when RuneScape play. When you come over here and you click on that play button, it'll go out, try to make the connection. Looks like it's going to 127. Host file. And then talk to your program. So now you can start listening and start getting all that information that it's trying to send out. Seeing if it's got an SSL, if it's got some kind of uh, certificate license, something like that. This is how you start the process of making a bot that uses a network layer. Again, like I said, these are really hard because you don't have the certificates. The certificates that they send out your direction is called a public key. Okay, It's not the private key. The private key is maintained on the actual servers out here where they're just smiling at you, going, ha-ha. And you only have the private key. So, but that is how to make a listener, theoretically. Remember, we're learning. Perfect. Now, I just had something in my head. What was I going to do? Public key, private key, oh, okay. So. Another big controversy that um, was given to me was why do I not use RuneScape Engine? Okay, one of my biggest reasons that I don't use engines and I don't use clients is because of those layers that I was talking about. So when you're, um, okay, when you're using one of these engines or clients, client, it's going to read off the memory inside the program, and it's going to say, hey, here's object troll, for example. Object troll, all right, and it's a hunter bot, and that's what we're looking for. We're going to try and find that that bot, boom, and we're going to issue a command called uh, obj dot attack. 
uh, and just like that. So it takes this object and it now forces an attack for your player to go over and attack it. There was no click. That, like There was no client side click. There was no physical interaction. That's a big no-no. That, that can get you caught really quick. If all you're doing is sending the command and there's no GUI interactions, that's m number one. Number one reason right here why I don't use the clients. Second, a lot of people ask me, uh, how do you do random clicks? Random clicks. Now, the reason I don't do random clicks and that I'm not worried about random clicks is because we are using that, that interface. So when you're looking at this interface like this, and you got your little 3D guy standing out there, right, with his awesome spell casting abilities, and he's got a sword and stuff like that. Some more lightning bolts, right? And you, the user, move your mouse up here and you click on something. Or you come over here and you click on something. What this is doing, it's causing a, a ray cast out to something. Uh, let's say there's a, there's a bad guy over here. And he's got a little shield. And it's like a minotaur, so he's got an axe of some kind like that. So when your mouse comes over here and it clicks, you can't think of it in a two-dimensional field. So let's turn this into a 3D object. So here's you staring at the screen because it's awesome. Err. I got your little mouse over here. You're looking at it in this direction. Inside the screen, you can think of this as a projection. So the mouse comes over here, right? And it clicks on this spot. It doesn't know what that spot is necessarily until it turns it into this raycast. So now, hold on, that's a bad perspective. Now, if you think of the way that you're angled coming down, looking at this thing, your guy is standing here like this with his hand raised up in awesomeness. He's standing here. He's got his sword. Right? And then the bad guy's over here somewhere grr, with his little spiky horns like that. He's got his shield. And it was a minotaur, so he's got those backward-looking leg things. Blah, blah, blah. Whatever. All right. So... When you click, this raycast gets turned into a three-dimensional object that comes over here into the verse, and it clicks on a point that's outside the body. Okay, so whenever I'm using a memory read, it says this object is located at X, Y, Z. So if I issue a command to go attack X, Y, Z, that's in the center of that object every single time. Now, you're telling me that somebody that's supposed to be using a GUI interface is clicking inside an object every single time you're using a bot. That gets you detected really quick. So because we're using the interface and our mouse moves over here and clicks, and it clicks on the ground, boom. Here's a little pile of gold that we missed a second ago. He'll come over here and pick up the gold. Now with the point, hold on, the point that that click happened was on top of the gold. And this is, it's so minute, you, like you wouldn't even realize it unless you were physically inside the game, which you can't physically do. But instead of clicking object at X, Y, Z, we now clicked a point just above it that corresponds to the mesh that is that object. So it's technically already a random click. It's, it's a legitimate click to a legitimate object without using the memory and without getting caught. So, the next thing that gets your bots caught. <clears throat> bot. Bot? B-O-T-T? -T? No, B-O-T-T. -T. Bot. Detection.
All right, so we've already talked about memory. No clicks. And second, we're going to talk about, or we already talked about um, Raycast. 3D to, oh wait, it's 2D to 3D. 2D to 3D. And the last one that we're going to talk about is randomness. Randomness. Or patterns. And you can think of this like triangle, square, circle, triangle, square, circle, dot, 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 for infinity. How many humans are going to sit there for 24 hours and do square, or triangle, square, circle, triangle, square, circle, at perfect times, perfect integers, constantly. Not very many. So, when you're doing a pixel searches, um, here, yeah, don't do same patterns. If you're going to do uh, a bot farm, or if you're going to do a lot of bots at one time, don't give them the same pattern. Don't use somebody else's script. One of the biggest things that people do is, hey, I've got a bot, it's for sale, it's for 10 bucks. And then 100 people buy it. They just made 1,000 bucks, everybody's using the exact same script, and it's going through the exact same movements. It's gonna get caught really fast. Um, the same reason that I warned um, all my scripts that are on my page, don't use them. All right, use them as examples to create your own. Do not buy bots, do not, like, this isn't a diss against the botters community. This is not to uh, devalue your product, okay? But this is to warn that if you have a thousand people doing the exact same thing at the exact same time, it's pretty, pretty easy to spot. So, randomness um, and... Uh, ownership, randomness, what do you call that? Not using something else, unique, unique spelling. So with these things in mind and with everything that we've talked about in all of my videos in the past, this should explain a lot about what um, you should expect when you're making a bot what you can do with a bot. Uh, we've discussed a couple of deeper layers such as um, memory hacking and art poisoning and stuff like that. You're going to get there eventually. Uh, if you're not going the network layer or if you're not going with the networking part of it, it's still something you need to learn. You need to learn how those protocols are coming across, what they're actually doing to talk to the network, what they're doing when they, they get out to the cloud, what the cloud actually is. The whole reason the cloud exists is because of the network layer. Just because you're programming a bot for a video game doesn't mean that it's not using the same things in the background. So, with everything that I've said tonight, uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. Like and subscribe down below. I hope I've not been too boring. And I hope that you guys have had fun. Good night. If I can spell it. <laughs>